I see our lecturer uh, is back, and it's good to see a, a, a sister in the family of Pentecostal charismatic tradition. We are everywhere. <laughs> so I teach the Pentecostal uh, heritage course here. I'm a product of Holiness Church, uh, and my first pastorate was the Church of God in Christ, Koji. Uh, so I'm I was Pentecostal before transitioning into the world of, of Baptists, so I'm what we call Bapticostals. <laughs> Your lecture, uh, giving shape to uh, significant developments in our recent history, has been so incredibly insightful and important. We cannot express our gratitude enough for you being with us um, today, and we are excited to hear your second lecture and to engage with you afterwards. So uh, my sisters and brothers here, uh, BSK, our president, faculty, staff, students, and all the many wonderful friends we have uh, here locally, uh, regionally, as well as all of those who are watching the live stream. Welcome back to this afternoon's Henson Lecturers. Dr. Payne. Thank you. Yes, I, I really appreciate that introduction. And yes, Pentecostals and Charismatics, they are, we are everywhere. So I don't want to freak you out or anything, but <laughs> yes, and Andre Crouch, who I, I had a picture of him, let's see here. Up in the corner is one, I think one of those really pivotal figures who is, who bridges the musical cultures of both black and white Pentecostals, hugely influential figure, um, who was, so Andre Crouch was um, raised Church of God in Christ. He was discovered by um, a man named Ralph Carmichael, who was an incredibly talented uh, person who was Assemblies of God. And so their kind of, their um, partnership, I think, illustrates a lot about those two musical cultures. So. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I am um, very excited. First off, that was a delicious lunch. Um, worth like way more than it costs to come here. I, I hope you agree with me. And I am glad I'm up here because I'd be tempted to take a nap right now um, if I wasn't up here, but that was so excellent. Thank you for your hospitality. Um, okay, so if there was, I, I mentioned it earlier that there were, pretty much three groups who dominate contemporary Christian music when it comes to the artists that play. There's the Baptists, and of course the Southern Baptists um, are the biggest of the white revivalist uh, uh, tradition. There's the Holiness Movement, so people like the Nazarenes, the Wesleyans. Um, and then there are the Pentecostals. And at first, they're kind of an odd group out. So Pentecostals were known for their controversial practices, um, including speaking in tongues and divine healing and exuberant interracial worship services. And all of these things were suspect in most of these conservative Protestant circles, especially in the early 20th century. So going back to like the Benson family um, in the, those early days, um, but as the songbook business grew in the early 20th century, it made friends out of foes. Um, and music and money brought these communities together that might not, all, not, might not theologically go together. So even when controversies were at their height, John T. Benson himself, he showed he was willing to compromise and work with the tongue-speaking people. Right? He noted that while his denomination, the Nazarenes, forbade such indignities, um, the Pentecostals were, quote, contributing to the fellowship with money and, quote, furnishing songs for the Pentecostal mission. So as long as these groups kept buying media and promoting uh, Jesus's imminent return and white Southern political values, there's room for, com for, for cooperation. And I have to say that Benson was right. The Pentecostals were excellent at furnishing songs uh, for the Pentecostal missions. Not just because I grew up in that tradition, but almost any form of American pop music has ties to 
American Pentecostalism. <laughs> so songs are very important in, in, in music is very important in the Pentecostal movement. And nearly all of the Jesus musicians that I talked about were from the charismatic movement, which if you remember is non-denominational or trans-denominational forms of um, uh, Pentecostal practices that really grew up in the 1960s and the 1970s. A lot of the people that you see here, Andre Crouch and uh, Keith Green, you'll see in the corner, um, they, they brought very spirit-oriented songs about Satan's presence in the world and the victorious Christ in, um, in many different forms, many different um, uh, really classic songs. But even people like Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, that undisputed king and queen of contemporary Christian music, they were part, they were deeply in, in, uh, involved in the charismatic movement in Nashville. In fact, there's a church um, that uh, is, is a very charismatic church called Belmont Church, that where both of them as young people were, were influenced in the charismatic movement. Amy Grant, I would argue, did the most to mainstream Pentecostal theologies about public life. And you might be thinking, how on earth can you even make that claim? Well, she introduced um, Assembly of God pastor turned novelist, a man named Frank Peretti who was author of a, I can only call it a Pentecostal horror novel, called This Present Darkness, um, that talked about demons and angels and really introduced a Pentecostal world to what I think of as normie evangelicals, right? The idea that every little thing that you do in your life, going to the grocery store, um, or finding a parking spot, everything has spiritual um, uh, spiritual repercussions, and that the fact that there's this demonic and angelic world happening um, right now as we speak, putting one of you to sleep, follow the angels, not the demons, and stay awake. You know, like that idea that there's this imminent spiritual world that you are a part of. Um, that 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 idea would have been considered very fringe in the 1980s in Southern Baptist circles, right? But then you have this young, beautiful Amy Grant, who is, and this is, and she did this a lot. She read that book in a Bible study because she went to a charismatic church, and then she would get do uh, at her concerts. She would talk about Frank Peretti and this present darkness and encourage her um, fans to read it, and it became a huge best-selling novel. I reread it. Someone read it to me. This is how Pentecostal I am. Someone read it to me when I was in the fifth grade, and it was. So Oh, scary. Um, and uh, I reread it for this book. And you know what? It's still pretty scary, maybe for different reasons. But um, yeah, so, so that kind of, that, be, these big entertainment oriented figures were bringing with them this, this um, previously marginal view and mainstreaming it through entertainment. Carmen, this guy right here. Oh. Zoom. I'm sorry, Zoom. Um, Carmen, the, the um, very dapper looking man in the tuxedo um, in the corner, I was going to point to him, he was, um, he, he, his entrance into evangelical Christianity came um, at Disneyland um, where he saw an Andre Crouch concert. Um, and if there is one thing that is so Carmen, it is Andre Crouch plus Disneyland. Um, and that's a true story. Um, and he brought a dramatic, Satan-busting, spiritual war warfare production into evangelical spaces. And fans responded by creating their own forms of entertainment based on his music. So I, I'm talking about elaborate set pieces where people are acting out battles between Jesus and Satan and how will it end? We're not sure, right? Um, Carmen is so fascinating to me because um, he is an, a fascinating example of Pentecostal influence because to a person, when I talked with CCM gatekeepers, so industry folks, um, booking agencies, people in bookstores, whatever, they hated Carmen's music personally, did not like it at all. And in fact, they often said that his Pentecostal imagination around demons and angels was irresponsible. 
It was heretical. It was unbiblical. Many thought his very unsubtle, hard-hitting renditions of religious right talking points were in poor taste or were offensive. But do you know who loved Carmen? Becky's. They loved Carmen. Look how handsome he is, right? Um, he, they, they, they loved it when he told them in a very popular song, the only hope for America is Jesus. And they loved it when he um, used language about a holy war against the powers of Satan that invaded public schools with things like safe sex policies and liberal ideas about sexuality. And they bought tons of his albums. They even packed out Texas Stadium and many other um, very large venues. Through his showmanship, he created this bombastic, patriotic, spiritual warfare world that traditional gatekeepers could not prevent. Right? They could not, they could not keep out of this contemporary Christian music world. And I think he is especially uh, important because he gave free concerts. Um, it was actually a donation concert, which it turns out people will donate more than they'll pay for ticket sales. He did all right financially um, with those, those concerts. But um, because they were free concerts, a lot of children were introduced to Carmen that way. Because, you know, I have small children. I'm not going to take my small children to an expensive concert. It's just not going to happen, right? Because I want to actually enjoy it. But I would take a seven-year-old to a free concert, right? <laughs> so a lot of people would bring their children. So he introduced this world, um, and I think it's fascinating because he is circumventing. The Beckys are overruling all of the denominational and the theological experts, right? They're saying, no, we like this person. So at the height of contemporary Christian music, um, and I, I identify that from around... 1999 to uh, 2004, um, this, this discrete media verse was unbelievably powerful in terms of what it could do in, in the public sphere. Um, in, in the book, I identify several concrete um, social and political changes that were executed in partnership with contemporary Christian music artists. Um, and by the 1990s, there were, there were CCM theme songs about national tragedies like the Columbine uh, shootings, 9-11. Uh, um, at any major event, there was a very well-selling contemporary Christian music response to whatever happened. And, um, you know, some of the most popular figures had very visible partnerships with the Republican National Convention, including Michael W. Smith, who was a longtime friend of the George uh, of the Bush family, both Bushes, um, and uh, performed at their national convention. I found a video from a Christian Booksellers Association event in 1999. They were celebrating, um, I believe it was 50 years of existence. And you know, have you ever seen a horror film where the beginning of a horror movie, everything starts out going really well, right? And you think it's this like idyllic neighborhood and all these things and something bad's gonna happen, you know, right? So in 1999, a bunch of Christian booksellers got together and they were celebrating the prosperity of this business. And they were celebrating in particular, the idea that Christian moms were finding uh, ways of reinforcing uh, evangelical values with their, uh, through, through music and other forms of media. And then, right, at the turn of the 21st century, contemporary Christian music spiraled into freefall. So the demise of contemporary Christian music, like those 1999 visions and celebrations, were just a couple of years from, from uh, uh, being a much different tone, right? Um, the demise of, of the industry of contemporary Christian music, and I want to be clear, people are still making music. You can't stop that, right? But the business has contracted quite a lot. And the demise is due to several factors um, that are, some of them are market-based and tech-driven. So the most well-known disruption to contemporary Christian music inflicted harm on the entire recording industry, which was the internet <laughs> and file sharing. Um, file sharing drastically reduced 
the uh, profits from recorded music. So in the early 21st century, it was, if you read any industry, music industry magazine, it was the sky is falling, because it really was. And it was being, the sky was collapsing because of, there were young people who were in their parents' house downloading songs instead of buying them, right? It was a completely impossible problem to solve. In fact, um, there were attempts to, uh, in fact, sue children for downloading files. Um, and nothing, nothing says unsympathetic victory more than suing a child, right? Um, who's like 13 years old. Um, uh, so uh, the entire recording industry was reeling in the early 20th century, 21st century. What do we do, what do we do? It, it decimated the entire music business, but unlike the general market, the mainstream market, CCM never really found a new normal because of changes within and among the evangelical communities that they were serving. So for one thing, um, the internet made it really hard for Becky's to regulate their family's media use. And that was a key component to the ascent of contemporary Christian music. I mean, I, and I am a parent myself. I feel that um, a lot, you know, like I, it is hard to, you have to go to uh, great lengths to keep the internet away from your family. No, I don't, I don't know how to do it. I haven't figured that out. Um, and so the internet really displaced the role of, of the mom, the evangelical mom, as the, as the uh, curator of the media in her home. Now, contemporary Christian music marketers also doubled down on white evangelical suburban moms. And that industry now serves an aging population that is not replenishing itself, demographically speaking. So Becky's are older than they were before, and they're not, they're not replenishing themselves. Christian radio stations, interestingly, have worked to target English-speaking Latinas as a potential substitute to bridge the, the demographic gap, but only with moderate success. CCM also suffered from competition in the evangelical parenting market. So for the Beckys that remain, contemporary Christian music is no longer the preferred tool in the suite of evangelical parenting tools. Other non-church oriented um, efforts have, that, that are based on edifying Christian youths um, have taken its place. So there are scholars like Paul Putz at Baylor, actually, um, who's, who's looking at how evangelical sports organizations, for example, things like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, they are thriving, and what they don't depend on is church attendance. You don't have to be a part of the life of the church. Contemporary Christian music was a churchy operation. Okay? And as the internet and streaming technologies change how all of us consume music, contemporary Christian music has suffered because there's no discernible canon of general market music to imitate. So, you know, if you, if you think about like the, the world of contemporary Christian music really depended on, okay, so in the 1980s you have Madonna. We need a Christian version of Madonna, right? Well, the way that people uh, consume music just generally has really disrupted the idea that there are musical, distinct musical cultures that can be represented on a chart. Now, younger people have very diverse music tastes and they freely, um, Will, will like step out of what you might associate with their particular social location. So the canon has been disrupted. So it's really hard to say, you know, we need a, we need a CCM version of this when, CC, when, when this is, doesn't look like a coherent top 40. So evangelicals have also consolidated how they worship. And I think this is really critical. And American Christians just generally, Big churches have gotten bigger, small churches have gotten smaller, but really the big loss is the loss of the medium-sized church. So this world depended on development networks. So if you were a, say you had a punk band, I'm gonna give a shout out to Tooth and Nail fans here, we could talk more about that tonight. Say you had a, a punk band and you wanted to um, make it big, you know, one of the, the, the sustaining touring strategies that you would use is you'd go to a small church and then you go to a medium-sized church and then you go to a really cool youth group in a large church. Well, those medium-sized churches have, are, are 
greatly diminished, right? So there's a hole in the, in the development networks. But also evangelicals are attending church fewer times per week than they have in the past. So one of the things that really sustained the industry was the idea that you kind of grew up connected to being in a church space for a large part of your week. You know, there'd be a Wednesday night service, a Sunday service. Um, but those, those attendance patterns have changed. One of the things that I think is really fascinating is that it's Americans have, are disaffiliating rapidly. So the denominations that were once key for CCM's distribution, the Southern Baptists, the Nazarenes, the Church of God Anderson, Church of God Cleveland, the Assemblies of God, many of those key denominations that drove public discourse are losing, they are dissolving their, their churches or they're dissolving their uh, formal relationships to institutions. I think a prime example of that is the once mighty Southern Baptist lost half a million members last year. So that will take a toll, those denominations, because all of those denominations also had um, denominational gatherings and youth revivals and all of those events that were connected to the institutions. Um, many of those no longer happen anymore. There are still a few remnants, still a few remnant uh, meetings. Um, and a lot of the, um, the opportunities, I, I think of them as revivals, the Christian music festivals that happen have greatly diminished. Most of the major uh, festivals are in some form, much, a much smaller version of themselves. Some have shut down uh, completely. Um, so for all of these reasons and for many, many more, Contemporary Christian music has, um, it, it is a much smaller version of itself. I think of it um, in its current form, it's not dissimilar to Southern gospel music. So in the 1990s, one of the most surprising CCM charting artists, um, it was a, a video series that became a recorded series called um, the Homecoming series made by um, Bill and Gloria Gaither. And in the 1990s, they were their, one of the really well-selling um, um, album of older people singing older songs. Um, it, it sold really well. I think that contemporary Christian music, um, it, its state now, there are lots of versions of that happening. So the youth crowds um, are, are diminished, um, and the, the Beckys are aging. And as they age, the industry, that niche is aging with them. But that does not mean the market for evangelical Christian consumers is dead, by no means. Um, the music of Pentecostal and charismatic churches um, is now the major generator of an industry that has replaced contemporary Christian music on the airwaves. And that is known in industry circles as the worship business, the worship music business. And I want to, oops, We'll save that one for the end. Um, this is a scene from Elevation Church, that song that I sang, um, the altar song that I sang. Look at that. Just wrap your head around the size and the scope of what you're seeing here. Those are people, by the way. I don't know if you can see in there. <laughs> There's just thousands, thousands of people worshiping. So I want to kind of do a little bit of a, a rewind here for you and say that as contemporary Christian music was really ascendant, there was another group of people who do not depend really on institutions for their like, sense of belonging and for their activism. Scholars like Brian Burge and Gerardo Marty point out that non-denominational practitioners are on the rise and that understanding them will be key to understanding the future of American Christianity. Now, sometimes non-denominational churches are characterized as Southern Baptists without an institution, but the music they play and the manner in which they worship through song suggests something else, that these are charismatic evangelicals. In fact, this photo that I, oops, I showed you, the, uh, oops, there we go, that photo right there, um, that is what, the like, Elevation Church is one of the it worship churches right now. A mega church that doesn't need a label, that doesn't need a denominational affiliation. They very recently disaffiliated from the Southern Baptist Convention, which I didn't, you would have had, you had to tell me that they were Southern Baptist because that was the most Pentecostal service I'd ever seen in my life. Stephen Furtick 
you've ever seen him. He tears it up. He's an incredible Pentecostal style preacher. Um, so he's barely, he was barely Southern Baptist to begin with. Um, but this is a disaffiliated church. They have, they are essentially not just a church. They are a media operation. And they are essentially a record label, a development network, and provide a platform uh, for some of the biggest figures in this world. So once a Southern Baptist congregation, very recently now a non-denominational uh, congregation. So in April of 2023, so last spring, um, I did some work with the Public Religion Research Institute, PRRI, and I had the opportunity to design some questions uh, to see how far and how widespread charismatic and Pentecostal expressions and practices were in Christian communities. So we asked people um, how, how often they'd been in services where people spoke in tongues, received divine or direct revelation from God, practiced um, divine healing or saw uh, people practicing divine healing, or received a definite answer to prayer. And on the whole, we found, it was stunning actually, we found that um, a huge percentage of, of um, Gen Z and millennial churchgoers, over half of churchgoing um, Gen Z and millennials, reported attending charismatic services, over half, compared to 24% of older respondents. 70% of them, we, didn't, we haven't published this yet, but said when, they're sing, when they sing in church, they lift their hands. I was just curious about that. So that's kind of a signature charismatic practice. Like I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, you could, you know, but putting all those things together, speaking in tongues, divine healing, raising hands in church. Um, Christian music airwaves reflect that trend. They now are rarely Rarely are they filled with substitute parallel entertainment. The sounds of evangelicalism are now the sounds of the non-denominational megachurch. And that, that sound is stadium rock music. And it's, it's unforgettable uh, here. Um, and rock, it's funny, rock is dead on the top 40, they always say, rock is dead. It lives in these megachurches. Um, in fact, Mega churches or, or churches are now one of the chief purchasers of guitars. Isn't that interesting, right? Um, so so from, from this perspective, the story of contemporary Christian music is the story of how Pentecostal and charismatic ideas were mainstreamed into evangelical spaces. And what worship shows us is how these groups move from the fringe to the center and are now ascendant in those networks that we think of as evangelical. Um, one of the things that, you know, I wanna go back in time a little bit to talk about in the 1990s when, when um, Amy Grant was crossing over into the mainstream and DC Talk was um, playing these really big, exciting shows, there were charismatic communities that were doing something different. They were making music for one another in Pentecostal and charismatic circles. And I'm going to play a little bit. This is just a personal favorite of mine. There's a lot going on in, in that video. This is that's the great great Ron Canoli, who, if this were a charismatic church, people would be like shouting at me. Um, yes, we love we love Ron Canoli. Um, and uh, the charismatic and Pentecostal worship uh, communities were making songs for one another and trading them across the globe. Um, I put now that the industry figures are largely based in white charismatic spaces. Um, but there were a, a, a little set of labels started to develop and publishing industries started to develop. Um, and this is, this is think the era of the worship wars when people were really upset about, you know, first it could have been an electric uh, acoustic guitar. 
and then an electric guitar, and then God forbid you have a drum kit, and that's where you get, I don't know, it's such a quirky thing when, when churches have those, um, those clear glass, plexiglass, whatever those fiberglass things to, so, to apparently, you know, uh, the drummer. Um, so anyway, um, charismatic uh, communities are starting to play songs for each other, trade them around the world, and they are facilitated by these businesses that are located in the United States, mostly in the United States, um, but they're also facilitated by a set of very um, uh, informal charismatic Bible colleges and congregations um, that are particularly, the particularly strong networks start to develop in the Americas. So uh, Canada, uh, like North America, South and Central uh, America. Um, these charismatic worship leaders from around the world were trained, many of them were trained at places like Rama Bible College in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry in Redding, California. And their music starts to crisscross the globe as charismatics in Brazil, Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, Honduras, Australia, South Africa, the United States, Canada, many other countries. Um, they start creating these new forms of music and they often have very international flavor to them. Like they're, they're, they're trading um, sounds as well as styles. I think it's important to note though that these are not apolitical worshiping communities, um, at least in the United States. Um, they, are, uh, uh, they are a different kind of theology about public life. So they're not the religious freedom appreciating, democracy promoting Baptists, like the figures like Billy Graham, who was really well known in the Cold War for, for um, promoting American democracy as a counter to the godless communists. Um, in charismatic circles, democracy is not the highest aim. There's a lot, they, this is a different move than Baptists, so forgive me Baptists, my Baptist brothers and sisters. Democracy is not the highest aim, nor is like the kind of American exceptionalism that figures like Sandy Patty promoted. So Sandy Patty, this, that holiness woman that I showed you earlier, who's singing um, the national anthem, she became, that was, she kind of was just the national anthem lady there for a while. Um, and she, she became famous in mainstream circles for it. She had this, she has this incredible acrobatic soprano uh, voice. And during big American holidays, she would often be the voice of the United States, singing about the United States as a sign of hope for the world. She, they really, she really picked up on Reagan's ideas about you know, appropriating language about the United States being a city on a hill, a distinct place, and democracy being really important to preserving um, that, uh, American democracy being a, a key part of preserving the kingdom of God, charismatics don't have that, that bent. In the conservative, predominantly white, but rapidly diversifying megachurches and wannabe megachurches that favor this worship music, they have a monarchical imagination. There's one king and it's King Jesus. And he's ruling over the, the world. And he has a nation in mind, but it's not necessarily the United States. It's the eschatological Israel. Remember when I was talking about Hal Lindsey, right? And, and that imagination, Hal Lindsey actually thought that the United States would not play an important role in the end times. Everything centered around the establishment of Israel. So that he was actually out of step with a lot of Cold War ideology about the role of the United States in the world. So these networks um, have a kind of patriotism, nationalism even, um, but at the end of the day, the nation is not the United States. They have produced enthusiastic support for one Donald J. Trump, who shares with them an appreciation for a lot of things like celebrity, um, and an affinity for a certain politic of disrespectability, you might call it lowbrow know-how, and a very flamboyant aesthetic. But perhaps most importantly, Trump entertains this eschatological vision with concrete actions, such as use, uh, moving the US embassy 
um, to Jerusalem. That, that actually didn't get like a huge play, but in charismatic circles, that was a huge deal, right? That was a huge deal. Um, so for Trump supporting charismatics, and of course, not all Pentecostals, not all charismatics uh, support him, but for the ones who do with enthusiasm, their position on the American body politic might be best summed up through the words of uh, Colorado Congresswoman, Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, who announced there have been two nations created for God's glory, Israel and the United States. People laughed a lot about that, but when I saw that, I thought, oh, she's really tapping into something, right? She's tapping into a decades-long conversation that was facilitated in these networks. Um, because it is not, pardon me, sorry about that. Because it is um, not based on American exceptionalism, the fascinating thing about this is it is a portable form of nationalism. You don't need to, it to just be the United States. So here's an example of a famous, what am I holding this for? Of a famous um, revival, charismatic revival in the 1990s. I wanna see, show you what they're doing. This is the revival at Brownsville, which um, was recorded in Pensil Pensacola, Florida. This is a, in charismatic circles, this is a huge deal. And I wanna show you what they're doing. First, they tear up a voodoo doll. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about that, although we could, but I just don't wanna distract you. I wanna explain that that's what's happening. It's very strange, but I, it's important for the, the other setup here. <laughs> You hear that? <laughs> Don't worry, the shofar makes it. Oh yeah, I blew it. I was gonna ask you if you knew what that was. Okay. It goes on and music enters the scene. But did you hear? So he's this, there's a, a figure who is playing a shofar, right? and he is saying, this is war, this is war. A little later in the video, um, a, the, the man who's holding the shofar explains the theology of the shofar. And in the charismatic imagination, it is not, a, not to be used for a solemn occasion, but as in the story of Gideon, it is used for war. And later on in, in the, like the service, it goes on forever because charismatics don't like a short service. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that he says is, Lord, we're believing you for the nation. We're believing you for the White House. Okay. So this happened in the 1990s, and most people paid no attention to it outside of a little bit of coverage in Florida saying, like, what are these people doing? This is so weird. Right? Um, but that theology, that imagination around the charismatic movement, the people of Israel, that idea that music was a powerful weapon of war keeps simmering. And it's not just in the United States, it goes all over the place. It's because it doesn't have the United States at the center of it, you could potentially do this anywhere. So one of the things um, that I think a friend of mine had done a lot, and I have done a lot of writing on is how the Trump administration has welcomed charismatic and Pentecostal people and rebranded them. They've gone a long way toward rebranding them as evangelicals. When Donald Trump put together an um, evangelical association, like a evangelical relations association, he put Paula White Kane in charge of it. Paula White Kane is the most Pentecostal televangelist you've ever seen. Um, in fact, she is here in the kind of the eggplant dress, um, I think two people away from, or three, maybe three people away from Donald Trump, platinum blonde hair, just very flamboyant, and she is Donald Trump's personal pastor. In no version of writings about evangelicalism that I have seen would you brand this woman as evangelical, right? Um, and yet, she was put in charge of this group, and what did she do? 
she brought her celebrity friends with her, including her musician friends. So in this picture, you'll see here, um, with, with um, former President Trump at the center of it, you'll see evangelical worship leaders from around the country and also the world, the former head of Hillsong, um, which is a huge Australian-based um, worship business, is there as well. Um, these folks are understanding what the Trump administration is offering them and promoting it. Um, many uh, of the, the kind of over-the-top expressions that were seen during the Capitol riots, the insurrection, um, on January 6th were from those movements. I played a show far here on purpose because in the days leading up to the Capitol riots, people were playing shofars outside and dancing to a Newsboys song, which was fascinating to me. And I remember seeing that, and I had a, a bunch of Pentecostal friends, we were texting, and I said, what is going on over there, right? Um, and it's hard not to see echoes of that decades earlier conversation. We're believing you for the White House, right? We're believing you um, for the nation. But it's not just in the United States. On January 8, 2023, two years and two days after the failed insurrection at the United States Capitol, during what historian um, Joao Chavez calls a twin insurrection, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro's supporters overwhelmed Brazil's presidential palace, Congress, the Supreme Court, um, stinging from his loss, much like the followers of Trump. Many protesters prayed as they gathered outside this gleaming modernist dome um, of Brasilia's capital, and Bolsonaro's wife, um, who is a charismatic and a huge fan of uh, charismatic worship music, um, posted this when she voted for him. Do you see her right there? This is the first lady of Brazil casting her vote for her husband. Whose flag is on her shirt? Yeah, yeah. And what she posted is, may God's blessing be upon Brazil and Israel. So this is a portable form of nationalism that is subservient to an eschatological Israel. Michelle Bolsonaro is a devout, charismatic Christian, big fan of Brazilian worship music, and helped rally support from among them for her, her Catholic husband, which is really interesting. She kind of helped brand him with, with those folks. And when protesters poured out uh, over the, the palace, Video footage from that day captured a lone figure standing amid flag wavers and passersby and police blowing a shofar into the sky. So these charismatic communities are connected through these forms of, of music, and they're often really hard to track down because they don't conform to the traditional institutions that we think of when we think of evangelicals, when we think of just doing Christianity in the United States. These transnational charismatic worship celebrities, they have no real need for Christian radio as a launching pad. One of the most fascinating things to me that I learned along the way was I kept asking, now I know that charismatic worship was growing in popularity and was being adopted in non-charismatic spaces. Why didn't we see it on the radio till after 2010? And a radio promoter told me a really funny story. He said, well, we tried. Their music was really good. They were making great stuff but we couldn't get, a, get them to give us a song that was under nine minutes long. <laughs> you need to have it, four is the longest you need to go on, on radio, right? Um, they had radio unfriendly impulses. They had these lengthy multilingual songs that included long breaks for speaking in tongues, altar calls, sermons, but guess what? They were growing even though they weren't appearing in that space, right? And um, I, I think the best example that I can think of, of this, is from a, uh, this is a song um, called Yeshua, has yet to appear on Christian radio, um, and has yet to appear on CCLI, which is the licensing um, organization that churches report like what songs they, they sing to, or they're singing in service. So it's not on all of those measures, it's hiding. Here we have,
Mountain song. There's like three or four flags. It keeps it keeps going. It's it's incredible. This is uh, this is the Eng that's the English language version. This is from the upper room in Dallas. And this is a bilingual version of it. Okay, so. These, these videos, oops, pardon me, have, let me see here, over 63 million video views of the first Yeshua that I played for you, over 4 million views of the second one I played for you. These are just two of the available versions of this song that go all over the world. This is a version of a dance anthem written by a guy named Guy Brazil, a Christian DJ living in Portugal. And the Jesus image version, this um, of a, it's very repetitive, 19 minute long song, retooled in a very dramatic way, captures an end times Zionistic feel. There are, there are versions of this that are performed in Jerusalem. Um, and Jesus image did not have to, the church that produced this, it's called Jesus image, they did not have to add a catchy verse or edit out any of the flag dancing or interpretive ballet to accumulate those 63 million views. Okay. They have figured out a way to completely exist outside of that market. And this, this other video is from two years later. So what I'd like to suggest to you is that not only the, the form of evangelicalism, like the way that Christians have practiced, it's, it is perhaps a different group of people than we imagine when we talk about who are evangelicals today. When people talk about, for example, the next few months, I guarantee it, we're going to hear a lot of conversation about the quote-unquote evangelical vote. If there's one thing that I would love to suggest to you, just to keep in your mind, who are those people? Have they in any way been transformed by their, these practices? No matter what the, the like belief section on their website says, I think perhaps they have. And these are not, when, when we talk about, there's a lot of conversation about um, what is quote unquote Christian nationalism. What form of nationalism are we talking about? Is it based in a form of American exceptionalism or is it a more portable transnational form? I'm looking forward to you know, following this. Um, I think we're going to see more of this activism um, in, in the coming months. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that the group that was once on the outside, the fringe, has now become the dominant strain. So when we are talking about evangelicalism, we cannot have Billy Graham in our mind, right? That era has now passed. And what has taken its place is not the conservative Southern Baptist form that most people have in their mind when they're saying evangelical. Um, it's a much more diverse, it's a transnational group of people um, who are connected through media and through the market, and they don't need traditional institutions in order to thrive and survive. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If uh, I invite you to come to this wonderful mic, uh, and if you are needing to stay in your seat, I can bring this um, not as wonderful mic to you. So. What do, if you're not in this tradition, what kind of hope do you have? And how do you go about uh, 
approaching the crowds, I guess. Oh, of approaching the charismatic type. No, oh, that's a great that's a great question. I think one thing that if if the reported practices um, are accurate, I think most churches that we would identify as as evangelical can be classified as as charismatic in some kind of way, um, even if they are Presbyterian or or, or Southern Baptist. Um, there are there are always holdouts. You know, people like John MacArthur every now and then will do a thing condemning spiritual um, like like speaking in tongues or, or something like that. But I think in those, um, uh, you know, I, I come from the charismatic tradition. I care deeply about um, charismatic people. I'm a child of Jesus people, right? I, I uh, care deeply about that. And I think, you know, it's really important to note that not everyone who's in a charismatic, I, the one thing that I, I tried to have a little caveat in, um, in my presentation, because I didn't want to suggest that everyone who's in the charismatic tradition um, is a you know Trump supporting like I'm going to go to the White House and and uh, play a shofar type of figure. What I meant to say is that the religious right is now very energized by that movement. So in previous years, it would have been Jerry Falwell, for example, would be like the kind of icon of conservative activism on the so-called religious right, or um, uh, Pat Robertson, the charismatic Baptist. I think he's a bridge figure actually. Um, but now, I think what that tells us is that the new form of, of American evangelicalism is charismatic. So you see it on the right, you know, in these kind of the religious right, but you see it just generally too. And I think we haven't uh, done enough to understand how these communities are able, uh, how they operate together and how they cooperate because we sort of have an institutional mindset. So we tend to think in terms of members membership or um, denominational networks of gathering and perhaps we should be thinking about in terms of just being in conversation with these folks understanding the media networks um, like a lot of these people it's actually a pretty small world a lot of these folks know each other yeah. thank you for your your lecture other one or two questions. Yes. So a lot was going on in the 80s and the 90s uh, in the black community, for example, with uh, the war on crime, the war mm -hmm. on drugs, uh, the Rodney King, the riots in LA. And often what you see with white Christianity is things will be going on and they just won't talk about them. Right. So was that the case with the CCM movement that they just kind of don't talk about those things and then secondly, how was the responses around 2020 and all the protests? Oh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Thank you so much. Yes, um, so I would say that a great example of how, um, one of the things that I tried to capture in the book is how the top of the charts reflect a particular way of evangelicals, especially in the late 80s and early 90s, talking about race and racism um, in a way that was comfortable to white evangelical audiences. So a lot of conversation about colorblindness, a lot of conversation um, in, in one section I talk about, so DC Talk, one of their, uh, which was the group that I played at the very beginning, their breakout album was titled Free at Last. And it is an appropriation of Dr. King's rhetoric and an appropriation in the sense that it replaces King's expansive social vision with a very personal um, uh, individualistic approach that makes a lot of sense if you think about DC Talk being formed at Liberty University. They were very reluctant to desegregate. They were very reluctant um, uh, to, um, to they basically, if you think about um, their conversation about race and racism as being comfortable in those spaces, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but one of the things that I also track in, in the book are how in the 1990s, a lot of um, black reformed um, Christians end up networking with white reformed Christians and some of the um, artists who come from that those communities, or at least were exposed to um, 
CCM audiences in those communities, people like Lecrae, um, are, are um, a, a product of these kind of networking relationships. But when Lecrae, um, in, in the book I talk about how when Lecrae started talking about Black Lives Matter, he, he was very frank about the fact that he lost a lot of business, um, that he, like, gigs were canceled, a lot, a lot uh, fewer people showed up, especially in those white reformed spaces, a lot fewer people showed up. Um, and then figures like Toby Mac, who had been a very, um, he talked a lot about um, uh, race and racism. He's the architect of, of the Free at Last album. Um, did, not, did not speak out publicly in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. I think that tells you a lot about those efforts. I don't know if that addresses um, your question, but yeah. So I think the CCM, like in order to chart, in order to be bought, purchased by Becky's, they needed to be in some way comfortable for them. And for those white suburban mothers, they were not interested in having those conversations. Dr. Payne, thank you so much for, for these conversations. As, as somebody who owned, I think, pretty much every album that you've oh, talked about. Oh, okay, great, thank This you. has been really healing for me. Oh. Um, but related to, to Dr. Brogdon's question, I'm really curious about this question of content, and I, I know we didn't really touch it on, on it too much in this space, but like, I remember growing up with like my dad's old Keith Green albums, and then like getting to be about 15 or 16 and realizing that my dad listened to this music, but he didn't believe a word of it. Mm. And like the churches that I went to were in this, but I found it incredibly compelling and convicting. And so for me, the actual content of this music was, and, and there were always these kind of subversive voices within the genre that even though they were finding commercial success, were always trying to sort of push against that mainstream. And even for me as like a sheltered evangelical kid in rural Wyoming, hearing DC Talk even mention race in yeah. music was mm -hmm. eye-opening. And so like, I'm struggling to articulate an actual question, but like, how do you as a historian maybe think about this kind of disconnect between what some of this music actually says, but then what evangelicals actually do, or the <laughs> right. ways in which some of these more subvertis, subversive artists found success in those spaces. I, I really don't have a question, but I'd love to hear some of your oh, thoughts in that. that kind of Thank arena. you, you're just thinking with me, yeah, and I appreciate absolutely. that absolutely. so much. Thank you. Okay, so the first one was about, okay, I wanna address the last part of what you said, which is what about those subversive messages? Because they were always, kind of fringe figures, subversive figures, especially in, um, in, in the 1990s, it, a few record labels on the West Coast um, started producing a lot of punk and ska and metal, and that had a lot of subversive messaging in it. For example, um, a, a group called Five Iron Frenzy, they have very dedicated fans. I would never mess with Eric, I see you over there. Don't put anything on Twitter about me messing with Five Iron Frenzy because they have one very dedicated fans. and. Um, uh, Five Iron Frenzy has a song directly condemning Manifest Destiny, like in very un, like unambiguous uh, ways. And I asked uh, Leonor Ortega Till, who is Jeff in um, Five Iron Frenzy, um, I asked her, how did you get away with that? Like that seems very, you know, in a world that's, you know, really praising a Carmen figure, who's like, we need God in America, prayer in public schools, that kind of thing, like how did you get those past the moms, and she said, she said, I don't think the moms liked the sound, and then the kids just put headphones on. <laughs> and so I think that actually gets again at kind of how tech disrupts things, because there were some disruptive messages. Now, uh, it's also true that a lot of like death metal and stuff was very, very much in line with, I mean, they're kind of comical, hard-hitting versions of like, you shouldn't have a condom in your, you know, like very, so there are very conservative versions of that same music, but I think some of the subversive stuff snuck into the, just based on the reality that Becky's wanted to listen to what they wanted to listen to in the car, which is what I do with my children, which is why my children know a lot of Foo Fighters. Um, but, <laughs> but um, uh, the other part, okay, I wanna get, just say a note about the complexity of all of this. I, I really try, and it's hard in just one, lecture to get at how complex stuff is. But I'll just use the example of DC Talk because you brought up the idea that for a lot of people, when they heard DC talk about race and talk about race and racism, especially for white youth group kids, that was like one of the first times they'd ever really thought about 
that stuff before, right? And so I try to capture a lot of that in the book. And also the fact that, that a figure like Toby Mac, on the one hand, he's a reliable mouthpiece for the Falwell talking points. On the other hand, he created a record label that is responsible for many of the black artists who charted in CCM, right? So it's complicated. I hope that that's, that's clear. It's a very complex um, network. I think in terms of the big data, the, the songs and the artists who succeeded were the ones who uh, were able to perform these idealized versions of evangelical life, but there's always complexity. And I hope, I hope to tell a story that's, that acknowledges that um, along the way. Thank you. Um, Hi. I kind of got a two-part question Wonderful. that's kind of going back to the part one yes. where you were talking about how different artists were policed based off of their gender expression, their identities, yes. like the, yes. the big thing with Amy Grant's yes. tour and Sandy Patty's, yes. right? And I was hoping you could maybe say a little bit more on perhaps how different folks might have been policed more than others. Yes. Like I was thinking with when you were giving the example of Amy Grant, like I vividly remember seeing Michael English who had a similar sordid history and he being brought back into the fold by the Gaither Vocal Band, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, we've all forgiven him. He should be right. back in the fold. But that that was never done for Amy Grant or Sandy right. Patty. But right. so, and maybe could you speak a little bit on, if you have done this in your research, talking about queer folks yes, in the CM? Yes, um, yep. And then my part two question, I was kind of interested where you're talking about how, again, like the worship space has now been, you know, what's replacing CCM. And has that kind of move away from like the singular figures or bands in CCM, like there's figures can look to. And now that the music is more like tied to broad churches, does that help shield people from these kind of controversies as Oh, that's great. Okay, so I'm going to try and do the first one. I might ask you to restate the second one, uh, which is the um, uh, about like which which people were regulated more than others, and especially about human sexuality, like gay uh, singer songwriters, of which there are many, for example. Um, so when, when you talked about Michael English, who um, uh, had an affair with a uh, singer, a member of a band called First Call, she. Um, got pregnant, uh, it ended her career, and he was eventually, um, I mean, she still sings, she's a very talented singer, but she's not a contemporary Christian music artist anymore, and his career was able to kind of revive um, in, a, in a slightly diminished, but overall um, welcome back into the fold way. Um, Sandy Patty, um, who had an affair with a singer, and then they, uh, they divorced, and she, remarried her husband. And there was a pattern, especially for women, who in some way did not live up to that perfect ideal. They would do sort of an apology tour. Jackie Velasquez did one as well. Um, and they are in some ways allowed back in to, in a limited, uh, a diminished uh, form. And in some, in some ways, it's just like there, were, there was a lot of competition for every Jackie Velasquez. There was somebody else waiting in the wings who they could promote. And a lot of the evangelical media um, organizers were always on the lookout for people, especially um, the Southern Baptist organization True Love Waits, which taught about teen abstinence. So they were always looking, and it's, there's kind of interesting quotes I include in the book where they're talking about, it's sort of high risk, you know, because if you're asking a 15-year-old to be your figurehead for teen abstinence, <laughs> like statistically, it's not gonna go the way you want it to go. Um, and so, so anyway, so there's lots of stories like that, but I wanna talk especially about, um, about four queer uh, artists. That has, in the past, been like, you're out when that happens. So um, people like Jennifer Knapp or Ray Bolts. Ray Bolts is the person I thought of when you were talking about um, Michael English, because he was also in those Southern Gospel networks. He came out and then it's just over, right? He's just gone. And um, you know, like when they do retrospectives on contemporary Christian music, you don't see his face, even though he was huge. He did the song "Thank You," which 
was about like, thank you for giving to the Lord. It was used in like community Thanksgiving services for decades, you know? So it's, it's an omission, I'm saying, um, you know, for him to be gone. But one interesting thing that I, um, I write about are queer artists who now are making music specifically marketed as Christian music. So for years, contemporary Christian music was sort of a mark of shame for artists because they didn't want to be associated with their mom's music, essentially, right? So they would avoid, you know, in the, in the 2000s, early 2000s, it was an era where I called the are they or aren't they a Christian band era because Christian bands didn't want to be uh, named as such. And I understand why. You don't want to be associated, if you're trying to be like a transgressive rocker, you don't want to be associated with my mom over there really loves your music, you know? Um, so I, under, I totally understand why. But artists like Semler, uh, Flamey Grants, um, who, is, who is a drag performer with the name of Flamey Grants, and when I found that, I was like, that's going in the book, you know? Um, and they are doing something really interesting, which is they say, I am a Christian artist. And in times past, this is another kind of like one of those Carmen examples, in times past, the strength of the institutions and the gatekeepers around what constituted contemporary Christian music would have been able to say, no, you're not. But now the way people consume media has changed so much that you can talk on the iTunes Christian music charts as a queer artist. So I, I found that to be fascinating. And I asked um, uh, Semler, why did you choose Christian music as your, you know, like, with the full understanding of the weight that went behind that word and also what it would mean, um, you know, what it meant to her as a teen, you know, growing up with, with Christian music. And um, Semler just said, you know, like, this is who I am, right? I, I get to say that I'm a Christian uh, music artist. And that, that industry can't define that. And the thing is, is there's a market for Semler's music and Semler can be at the top of the charts in a way that prior to that, Christian bookstore owners, and one thing I didn't mention in the lecture, but this is a really important part of contemporary Christian music, is most of it was distributed through Christian bookstores, not through music stores. And Christian bookstores were owned mostly by holiness people, Baptists and Pentecostals, who really, like the, the business people in the early 20th century, really um, practiced, this was, they were very devout in how they um, ran their businesses, and so for them, they, they themselves would take artists off the, the uh, bookshelves if they did something that they felt, like there's an example, a funny example of how Amy Grant had a, a shirt with three buttons undone. And if you looked at it, you would be like, that is a very modest <laughs> shirt, you know. But for some holiness people, you know, if you grew up in the holiness tradition, you know, like, I am, I am a, Jezebel Pentecostal by, you know, comparison. I got short hair, you know. Um, but uh, that, you can see that actually that would be a very big deal if that's your tradition. So, but those people, Christian bookstores are so diminished. Like the Christian Booksellers Association, which was the trade organization, was a huge instrument for promoting CCM. It does, it's defunct now. So those gatekeepers don't exist and those artists that would have, it would have been impossible um, years ago, now find audiences. Thank you. I've got a lot of questions, but I don't Thank know if I should just do them all. One is like, uh, you know, you had back in the 50s, 60s, you had secular artists that come out with a gospel album. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how that fits into later. Everyone had, you know, Elvis had one or two. Absolutely. And, with uh, the Imperials. As yeah, talking. right, right. Yeah. Uh, this is not related, but you had the, the baptized celebrities like Bob Dylan and, yes. and uh, B.J. Thomas. I've got a B.J. Thomas story I'll share if you want. Sometime. Oh, wonderful. I love it. And uh, how does that fit into this? And then, and then is it, at some point, Sony and others buy a lot of these companies, mm -hmm. right? And how does that all change things? Yes, that's great. And okay. then my, my last question, I'm sorry, is, no, that's good. Sorry, this is a sociological question, is like, do you really see this Muse this so uh, how you charismatic Pentecostal music driving global Christianity because really Pentecostal charismatic movement really is and yes. how much of the music is behind that? 
Wow, that's so great. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the first one was Elvis. Okay, so Elvis and um, the, the, one of the things that I write about in the book is that this is why the effort to ban rock was never going to succeed, in part because the people who created rock were church people. Um, and they didn't see a distinction between what they were doing and church music, and Elvis is just one that I use as an example because he toured with the Imperials, who are a contemporary Christian um, music act. And but people like, you know, all the people that identify as Little Richard um, and even like country artists like Dolly Parton has always identified as Pentecostal. I always put her. I have like a Pente top Pentecostal chart. She's always pretty close to the top um, for me. But uh, anyhow, so the the folks themselves were rejecting that binary. So I think that's one of the things that contributed to the, the it just was an unwinnable war against rock. Um, but the other question that you asked was about, oh, people like Bob Dylan. Yeah, so Bob Dylan had a very charismatic, he had a Jesus movement experience in um, vineyard churches on the West Coast. He was like a textbook Jesus person conversion, except for he was also known as maybe the greatest songwriter the American people have ever produced, right? You could put it, you, you've got to put him in conversation with, with a lot of different uh, people. So at the time, industry, CCM industry people thought, this is great. Bob Dylan is now going to become a CCM um, artist. He was, um, and he also adopted a lot of that apocalyptic theology and it, it produced some really really incredible music from it. Um, and the thinking at that time was, and this is so interesting, I remember talking to a, a CCM executive who said, we should have learned our lesson with, with Bob Dylan. I was like, what are you talking about? And he said, well, everyone thought that when Bob Dylan converted and started making music about it, all his fans would convert too. <laughs> and they didn't. So, you know, I think for most Dylan fans, it's like, oh yeah, he had a phase, you know, where he, did this, who Dylan fans who are not contemporary Christian music. Um, but it was very meaningful in the contemporary Christian music world um, to have someone of his stature uh, convert. And then the last question you had was about Pentecostal and charismatic. Is that, did I get, I felt like there were four, but I can only remember the last one. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so big business, like corporate takeovers happened very early on, like in 1976, I think, or 1979. Um, ABC uh, purchased um, a good part of, of Word Records. Um, corporate, uh, corporations who saw in the constituents that CCM was serving uh, overlap. So corporations like Disney especially were like, oh, we're serving the same people. We should work together. So um, Disney started a, a um, regular contemporary Christian music night, Night of Joy. Um, and uh, corporations like Target partnered with, with Amy Grant. Um, the corporate buyouts of, so the vast majority of music that is produced under the, as, uh, under the niche of, of um, CCM is owned by uh, non-religious corporations and that started in the 19, early 1990s. So it's been a long time um, that, and, and I think that's, kind of helps explain some of the more bombastic figures who, like, for example, I heard a kind of an off the record story, so I, I didn't put it in the book, but a story about when Carmen was signed to a, um, a label that was owned by a big corporation and the evangelicals who were like working at, they, you know, they were working at an evangelical business. They were horrified by it, but the higher ups just said, hey, this guy sells, you know, they're atheological, they don't care. So. So whatever sells, um, um, they're, they're fine uh, promoting. Um, so yeah, that started in the, the 1990s. And there was a little, but there was quite a bit, like in the industry, there was some hand wringing and a lot of conversation about what does this mean for us if we are not owned by, in their minds, by churchy oriented places. And by that, really, that just meant people who were members of, you know, Southern Baptist holiness uh, churches. And in, in many ways, um, that conversation is still alive. So one of the kind of the ornerier voices in that was a guy named Steve Camp, who um, is still very active on social media today. And you just check it out. I don't want to spoil it for you, but um, he had this. He wrote um, it basically like a Martin Luther's theses about CCM, arguing that Christian uh, music should disentangle itself from corporate interests. 
uh, for theological reasons. He's a very hardcore reform guy. Um, and, but then other people, um, one of my favorite figures who pops up again and again, a guy named John Fisher, um, had a, an editorial on the back page of CCM Magazine. And he asked very uh, fascinating questions about what pro the prosperity of the industry meant for the status of the soul of the industry. So um, there were, there's a lot of interesting voices, but yeah, I don't know if that's helpful. I think we're finished with questions, but I want to offer another round of applause. Oh, thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Payne, and thanks to all of you for coming today and spending uh, a morning and an afternoon uh, thinking about contemporary Christian music and uh, the state of the culture and, and the state of the, uh, the world that we all share. Um, you can see Dr. Payne again this evening at 7 o'clock at Joseph A. Uh, Beth Booksellers. You can come and share your stories that you've said that you, when you have time, so she'll be there. Um, and so 7 o'clock, come out, see some of us there. A quick note about next year. Next year's Henson Lectures uh, will be on March the 5th, and we'll return to Louisville next year for our Henson Lectures. It'll be a different kind of day, March the 5th. Um, we will have a lunch and an afternoon lecture with uh, 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 Dr. Brian Blunt, um, a fantastic scholar, um, uh, sort of a statesman in theological education. And then uh, Dr. Blunt will be spending an evening uh, at a, um, a church in Louisville for a church event. And so you can come out, see him in the afternoon, uh, and then maybe go to a church event that evening uh, for a different setting. And so we're still putting that together, but please come out next year, March the 5th, in Louisville. Uh, look for details. We'll, we'll, uh, we will be getting with you. I uh, feel like you owe us an altar call today. <laughs> no? No, you're just going to pass? Okay. We'll hear now a benediction. May God, the God who gave us rock and roll, be with you in your departing and be with you in your living out of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>